You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Fatima Mohammad Kazem on plight of women in Afghanistan. We'll also be discussing the heinous stoning of a young woman, Rukhshana, in Afghanistan, as well as the murder of another Bangladeshi secularist. We'll talk about an insane fatwa from Saudi Arabia on the women you're allowed to marry and not. Uh, we'll talk about an Iranian actress who has had to flee Iran after posting photos of herself without the hijab. And we'll also be talking about uh, the funeral of a wonderful labor rights activist, Kurusha Bakhshande, as well as female cricket as a form of protest against the Islamists. Stay with us. There are many events that have uh, gone by this past week. Of course, we have to start with the heinous stoning of 19-year-old Rokhshana. Uh, in Afghanistan, she was uh, tried by a, a Taliban court, reported uh, allegedly. Uh, there's disagreement on who tried her exactly, but um, definitely an Islamist court. And she was stoned to death. There's video footage of the stoning, which is really heartbreaking. You know, you can hear her screaming. And uh, you can see men throwing stones without any reaction, as if they're throwing stones at a wall, not, not a real live human being. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, although the world is reacted to this, I feel there should be outrage. Um, the reality is that the police and the officials in Afghanistan did nothing to protect her, and the family wanted to marry her. And you know, this is the <coughs> plight of many women in Afghanistan. And you, you wonder what else can, can people do? And I think there should be a lot more outrage at it. I think it's good to see that a lot of people have uh, um, responded to, to the situation and demanding a better protection for women. But the world, we can't ignore this. We can't forget what's going on in Afghanistan. Yeah. And it goes back to the way women are perceived, you know, as ownership and property of the male guardian in their family uh, to do with them as they want. And the fact is that really she has been stoned to death for love. She ran away. She didn't want to get married to the older man the family wanted to marry her off to. They then dragged her back from Iran where she had fled, married her to a 60 year old man. Again, she ran away and eloped with a man she loved and they've dragged her, stoned her to death. He was flogged again, you know, of course, no one should be flogged or stoned, but discrepancy between what women faced and what, what men faced. And, and the reality of these, the, the, a lot of resistance in Afghanistan, a lot of women in Afghanistan are opposed to the situation. A lot of people have run away from Afghanistan because of this situation. And um, people need to sort of be able to change the situation. There, there has been military intervention supposedly for better life in Afghanistan. Look at the results of yeah, it because we, it relied we, on the... It's not enough. It's yeah. not enough. I mean, you know, with stoning it was banned. But again, as late as in 2013 under Karzai's government, they were planning to bring it back. There was a proposal to bring it back. This information leaked. There was outrage internationally as well as within Afghanistan. And so they uh, again pushed it back. But this is something that we need to really um, scream out against. You know, we sh this should not be happening in the 21st century. Uh, you know, this should really be the last stoning. Yeah, Can we all agree that yeah. this will be the last stoning? What are we going to do to make sure it never happens again? And, and complete protection for <coughs> women of Afghanistan. And that needs to be priority yeah. of everybody across the world, protection of women in Afghanistan and uh, defense of their rights. Yeah, and going, you know, following through from that <clears throat> and the situation of women under Islamic laws, you have the case now of the Iranian actor. Her name is Sadaf Tahirian. She posted uh, photos of herself without the hijab as a, a form of criticism of the hijab, as a form of protest, as many women in Iran are doing. As a result, they said that she was immoral, that she had shamed in the nation. Uh, they banned her from doing any more work, and she has actually now had to flee the country as a result. And the Islamic uh, regime and the supporters have actually been abusing her on social media, and actually they've doctored her pi picture and sort of photoshopped her job on on her head, and she's she's you know she's protested as openly protested, and now she had to flee because of the pressure. 
ولی جسارتم از جایی شروع شد که به گذشته فکر کردم وقتی گذشته رو مرور کردم وقتی که از دفترهای مختلف سینمایی به هم زنگ می زدن و با, با کلی شوق و زوغ می رفتم سمت دفترشون برای بستن قرار داد اما متاسفانه با جملات وقیحانهی مواجه می شدم و این باعث می شد که از اون دفتر تا خود خونه فقط عشق می ریختم. فقط گریه می کردم که چرا؟ برای چی؟ در مورد هر چیزی صحبت می شد به جز کار خب یعنی چی؟ پیش خودم فکر می کردم که من چی کار کردم؟ من با چه ظاهری رفتم اونجا؟ خیلی ساده خیلی نرمال مثل تمام کسایی دیگه که ما روزی هزار نفر رو داریم توی خیابون می بینیم من فقط توقعی از فرهنگ ایرانی نداشتم که این همه اهانت بشنوم و این همه توهین بشنوم و واقعا نمیتونم نمیتونم مثل خودشون جواب بدم نمیتونم مثل خودشون برخورد کنم و فقط میتونم بگم که متاسفم واقعا هیچی ندارم در جواب این سوال بگم من دلم میخواد که جای زندگی کنم دوست دارم جوری زندگی کنم که خودم خوشحالم Well, she's out of the country now, but she said that the only reason she did wear a veil is because she had no choice, you know, and I think that's the reality of the veil for many people. And something interesting um, is that when you're a woman actress, uh, not only do you have to be veiled, not only do you have scenes where if you're even married to a man, you sleep in separate bedrooms because it shouldn't be shown, even to the extent where if you've got a, a young boy, let's say if it's your son who's 10 or 12, who goes, uh, you know, you're not really supposed to touch him anymore because he's too old now for you to be hugging it's and kissing your child. It's just a disgusting way of looking at human relationships. Relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Religious <coughs> and particularly Islamist and Islamic sort of uh, religious in, in, in these situations clearly create an inhuman in, in environment for everybody. Even the relationship between mother and child, her, yeah. her children yeah. Yeah. are deemed to be, no. um, you know, um, immoral effectively. Yeah. Yeah. They, they can't have, you know, they can't hug each other, they can't, it just, it's disgusting. Yeah. And okay, following again, you know, going now to Bangladesh, yeah. uh, we're seeing the, really, the, 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 the hunting of atheists and seculars. They are hunting people. They've put their names on a list. They are hunting them one by one. And uh, the latest news is, of course, the publisher, the secularist publisher's name is Faisal Abedin Deepan, and he has been killed. Uh, you know, and the question is, how many more must be killed before the Bangladeshi government takes action, real action? Yeah, and, and we, we've said time and again that the Islamist movement, uh, it's a killing machine, and they're doing it everywhere. And people need to recognize this is a fascist movement that across the world is... Uh, um, it, it just destroying people's life um, and need to be stopped. And this is, it needs a global re, uh, reaction to it as well. But at the same time, there's so much resistance um, um, on uh, against the Islamic regime, even when they're power from various quarters, and we need to see and recognize these uh, uh, resistance. I mean, there's a case of how people came out in support of a labor activist in the city of Sanandaj. Yeah, but before that, sorry, I wanted to say something about this case before we move on, is that uh, the British High Commissioner in Bangladesh, he condemned the attack and he said, and I quote, violence is never the answer or acceptable in any circumstances. Really? Is that all the British High Commissioner can say? It's as if it's their fault for being secular publishers, but violence is never the answer nonsense you know there has to be a much stronger condemnation unequivocal condemnation of what's happening uh, and uh, next week we're going to be interviewing um ajanta deb roy she is one of uh, she is the only women woman on an international global death list um uh, of uk-based bloggers of course people like tasima nasrin are also on such dead death list and we'll be talking to her in more depth about this but sorry going let, now let, to let's look forward to that to, as well yeah no, i think that there's a lot of, we were saying that there's a lot of resistance yeah. against the islamists and you see that regularly uh, taking place across the middle east and north africa La uh, earlier this week um we had the uh, commemoration of a labor activist who died um, uh, recently because of the heart attack. He's been in and out of prison and under pressure by the security 
um, security forces in Iran. And people actually, when he died, hundreds of thousands, thousands of actually, people yeah, came out in support of the severe restrictions in Iran. They had his photograph. They had the, the, the Red the Union banner out in, in support of um, him. And despite the pressure and banning by the Islamic regime, people came out and commemorated uh, yeah. you know, yeah. his, his life. And these are the sign of things you, you, we could see. And it happened, this happened in the city of San Andres. Yeah. Time and again, we've seen the protests, uh, you know, the strong social and secular movement in the city of San Andres. And this is beautiful to see. So while there is a killing machine in power and in, in, in position of, uh, you know, uh, power really in many countries, at the same time, there's a lot of resistance yeah. that is um, taking place and it's good to see. Yeah, and so we, we also uh, really uh, commemorate this uh, uh, hero, fallen hero, um, uh, who's, who's died recently, uh, Kurosha Bakhshande, and he was buried with the Internationale as well. <laughs> Now, the insane fatwa this week is from, of course, you know, Saudi Arabia. Who else? Where else? Why else? And it's a law, actually, the law of the land, which makes it even more special, which says that there are four nationalities that Saudis can never marry. That is from Chad, Bangladesh, Pakistani, and Burmese. Why do single out these Sounds four? Sounds a bit racist. <laughs> <laughs> it does, absolutely. It is. But why are they have to single out to well, sort of Chad but not Ghana? I mean, what, what's going on hmm, here? That's a really good question. What? Maybe they don't, yeah, they think everyone from Africa is one, it's one Just country one Chad, and it's know. Chad. Okay, right. I mean, I, I don't understand what the rationale for this but, is. But no, this is brilliant because they've got this thing of, um, uh, which says that um, this is not allowed completely. But if you marry Moroccan women, I, I don't know what they've got about Moroccan women. If you marry them, though, you have to make sure that she, her profile is free of any crimes and serious diseases and that she's not a drug addict. I think the worry that there might be a lot of secularists in, in because there are a lot of secular women in, in, in Morocco, the Morocco and they're worried you know, about these countries. Possibly they're worried that there are a lot of you know strong women in those in, in these countries. I have no and, idea. And what what, are, what about this? They had said something about in addition, an applicant who's already married to a Saudi woman must attach so this is like his second wife, because you know, he, he needs more than one, must attach a medical report on the status of his wife confirming that the first wife, the Saudi wife, is sick, disabled, or cannot give birth, and only then he can have a non-diseased Moroccan well, woman. But if it was his second wife was from Saudi Arabia, it was okay. Of course. Didn't he? Okay. Yeah. So th th this, I, is, this is Islamic it's sad, racist. But, but, Re but Reza was saying something really funny that he read about a court case where uh, there was an accident between a Saudi and a foreigner, and they had said, well, it's your fault you know, the foreigner, because you should, if you were not here, there would not have been an accident. So, I mean, it's perfect for the EDL and BMP. They should, you know, take some guidance from that. It's exactly their sort yeah, of viewpoint. Yeah, I think we just be careful that David Cameron, when he goes there, he doesn't have an accident. <laughs> Early November, a group of female, uh, uh, female students in Pakistan at the University of Karachi, as a form of protest, they went and played cricket and they announced on their Facebook page that they were going to do this in protest to an event that had happened a bit earlier. Yeah, there were a, a group of sort of uh, um, students, male and female, they were pr playing cricket and the Islamist group, local Islamist group, came and beat them up so because you're not allowed, women are not allowed to play cricket right. in a mixed environment. Forget about playing cricket, but you're playing with boys and girls. So there was an uproar in Pakistan and women, young women of Pakistan 
the ones who can stop the Islamists <laughs> came out in Students in, came out, in, yeah. in support yeah. of you know the right to play, and they played. They had a girls sort of cricket uh, yeah. with no hijab, everything, and just beautiful it's, scene to see. It's uh, cricket, cricket. Even cricket is a form of resistance against the Islamists because they hate anything that is enjoyable. So what, what better way? We're now going to look at an interview with uh, Fatima Muhammad Kazem. Uh, she was interviewed actually by a wonderful women's rights campaigner, Farida Arman, in Sweden. Now, the reason we wanted to show you this interview this week is because it is so relevant to the stoning of Rokhshana, uh, you know, just last week as well from uh, via the Taliban in Afghanistan. She talks about uh, the situation of women in Afghanistan. You, you really have to listen to this interview to fully understand what women are going through there. Watch this interview and we'll come back to discuss it further. خوشحالم از اینکه دعوت ما رو قبول کردی و اومدی توی این برنامه شرکت می‌کنی و می‌خوای که حرف دل تو به گوش مردم و جهانیان برسونی. بله. میشه خودتو معرفی کنی؟ بله، ما فاطمه محمد کاظم از از افغانستان هستم از کشور افغانستان افغانستان چند سال داری فاطمه جان من 36 سال هستم 36 سالته من دوست دارم بگی چی شد که تصمیم گرفتی قبول کنی که بیای تو این برنامه ما از خاطر ما میفهمیدم که دیگه برنامه اگر اشتراک کنم جان من زیاد در خطر است جان بچه هم در خطر است مگر بازم ما از خاطر دیگه برنامه شرکت کردم که من میخواستم که درد دل خود درد دل, دل لکا میلون زنای افغان از دیگه کشور را میخواستم که در اینجا بیان کنم بگویم میخواستی بگی برای مردم دنیا که چی داره میگذره بله که سر خانم های افغان چی میگذره چه قرار جد را میکشن در افغانستان چی حالات از سر زن ها که میلون ها زن خودکشی میکنن جان خود از دست میتن از خاطر که بسیار سرشان ظلم میباشد من میخوام مثل یه نمونه یه نمونه از اون میلون ها زنی که ازش اسم بردی که خودت با گوشت و پوست خودت اینو تجربه کردی این این بی حقوقی رو این این زج رو این تبعیض رو تجربه کردی میشه برامون از اول از موقعی که کوچیک بودی یه مقدار بگی بچه بودی بله بچه بودم چی دست میخواستم مدرسه برم مگر مدرسه رفتن نمیتونستم از خاطر که اجازه نداشتم که بچه های دیگر رو میدیدم که مدرسه میرفت خیلی گیری، گیریه میکردم رنج میبوردم که چه این بچه ها چرا به مدرسه میرن من رفتن نمیتونم چرا من امرای بچه ها بازی کرده نمیتونم خیلی رنج میبوردم از بیس آه که رنج خود تا حال میبرم که بیس وات ماندم ما میخواستم ما آرزو داشتم که دیگر بچه ها باره مدرسه برم با سواد باشم با امرای بچه ها بازی کنم منم <تصفيق> تو پدر مادرت من برام تعریف کردی که در یک حادثه بمب بمبی که منفجر شد پدر مادرت تو کشته شدن و تو تو رو خالت و شوهر خالت بزرگ کردن از از چه سالی تو مجبور شدی به اینکه برقه و حجاب سر کنی من چهار سالم بود چهار سالم بود که برقه در سر کردم دوست داشتی اون هجاب و اینا رو؟ نه خیر من دوست نداشتم چون که من خیلی کوچک بچی کوچک بودم من دوست نداشتم که من میخواستم دیگر بچه ها رو آزاد باشم برقه در سر نباشم برم در خیابان امرای دیگر بچه ها بازی کنم منم چون که من اجازه نمیداد چون که من یک دختر بودم تا تو یه ذره بزرگتر شدی و شوهر خالت برای تصمیم گرفت که ازدواج کنی بله من در سن عبده سالگی برای من شوهر خالم تصمیم گرفت که ازدواج کنم 
دیگه ازدواج کردم و امرای یک مرد که طالبان بود دیگه برم خوش آیند نبود از خاطر که اون مرد خیلی طالبان بود و دیگه آدم مسلح بود و مسلح میرفت و میامد و قیافهش بسیار ترسناک بود دیگه دوست نداشتمش ایک دوست نداشتم اجباری بود فقط اجباری بله اجباری از تنما از میلونا زن در افغانستان اجباری است آروسیایشان نمیتونن که خود خانم ها نمیتونن خود دختر خانم ها نمیتونن که برای خود تصمیم بگیرن زندگی خود پیش ببرن پیش ببرن همین باعث میشه که دختر دختر خانم ها و خانم ها خود خودکشی میکنن و آتش میزنن و دار میزنن میزنن و همین کارا میکنن تو زندگیت با این شروع شد که رفتی تو خونه یه نفری که اصلا 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 نمیشناختیش، اصلا ندیده بودیش، اصلا انتخابش نکرده بودی بله و چطوری میگذشت روزانت؟ روز، روزت چطوری میگذشت؟ بله، خوشایند زندگی نبود دیگه که بازم از خاطر که در مملکت ما میرقم قانون هستن که زن ایچ حق و خوق نداره بازم قبول کردن امی کارا وقتی که رفتم دیگه از اون وقتی که رفتم و ازدواج کردم رفتم دیگه ظلم و زدن و کتک میزدیم زیاد شروع شد بازم در کتک خودم اقدر رنگ نمی بردم رنگ می بردم که یه خانم بودم چرا مرا کتک بزنم بازم اقدر رنگ نمی بردم وقتی که بچه دار شدم بچه های مرا میزد زیاد رنگ می بردم بچه هست دیگه او چی را می فهمه که می تو دو تا دختر آوردی؟ بله من دو تا دختر آوردم دو تا دختر آوردم دیگه سر من زیاد ظلم میکرد چرا که چون که میگفت چرا پسر ناوردی که من اتم خود طالب جورش کنم اون که دختر پسر بیار اون که دست من نیست من خود نمیدانم که دختر میشه پسر میشه مگم او آدم نادان بود جایل بود نمیفهمید میگفت نه باید پسر میاوردی که من رقم خود طالب جور میکنم مگم من خوش بودم که من دختر میاوردم چرا که من پسر رو خوش ندارم بعد تو زندگی اینطوری میگذشت که این شروع کرد هی دائم تو رو بخاطر این که چرا بچه دختر آوردی تو رو مورد خشونت قرار میداد کتک میزد بچه ها رو کتک میزد چطوری تحمل میکردی؟ واقعا برای من سوال چطوری تحمل میکردی روزا رو؟ ما مجبور بودم که تحمل میکردم دیگه چهاره نداشتم هیچ کمک دولتی هیچی نبود که بتو کنم اونجا هیت کوچی نمیکنه هیت نه دولت کمک میکنه نه هیت چیز نه پولیس نه پولیس کمک میکنه نه دولت کمک میکنه هیت چیز نه مجبور است که کل عمر یا دست به خودکشی بزنی یا چی کنی یا تحمل کنی امی چیه؟ همی زندگی. امی زندگی رو تامل کنی زن. دکن ما خودم دادم فر میر خواستم که خود کوشی کنم دچا دچا یا آب خدا پرتم. من خود تو دچا یا آب نزدی. بله. من مثلا چشمای بچه هم که می دیدم می گفتم که زندگی از یا چی را کم میشه. چون که زندگی از یک من نباشم یا چی را کم میشه. از او خاطر نه دانستم که خود کوشی کنم. ما هم بالاخره یک تصمیم گرفتم که باید فرار کنم از اینجا من می توانستم که می فهمیدم که من اگر فرار کنم جان ما در خطر از اگر ما را بگیره دستگیر کنه عرصه ما را می کشه مگم بازم هر ستاتونم بله حتی بچه های خودش هم حاضر بود بکشه هم بله بازم از کشتن خود راضی بودم از این که هر روز زدیر می کشیدم ترجیح دادی که بمیری ولی فرار کنی و بچه هات هم جونشون رو نجات بدی بله این برای من تعریف میکردی میگفتی که این من میدیدم که همین سرنوشتی که من الان دوچارش هستم همین سرنوشت قرار بچه های من هم دوچارش بشن بله و من باعث یه راه حلی پیدام کرد بعد فرار کردی کجا رفتی؟ باز رفتم کابل خانه خاله آره بعد از اون نمیتونست اونجا تو رو پیدا بکنه؟ این فرار کردی به جای دیگه این؟ نه که من رفتم خانه خالم باز از اونجا خوا... رفته خاله من رو دیگه جای پنهان کرد پنهان کردش؟ بله بعد چی شد؟ باز اونجا میرفتم یا خانه یعنی کس که کار میکردم از خاطر که به اولاده هم یعنی نان چیز پیدا کنم لباسه ها رو میشودم باز یک خانه یک خانم بوده که 
اونجا که رفتم باز برادر از او برادر از او من اونجا دیده دیگه باز خو من گفتم من امروی ازدواج میکنم من کل قصه زندگی خدا برش کردم که من جان من این رقم در خطر از من این رقم کتی آگه آدم طالب و روسی کرده بودم از این دو تفل دارم این رقم بازم دمه قدر که من کل داستان زندگی خدا برش گفتم که میفهمید که جان از اون در خطر میشه بازم آدم خوب بود باز بازم من قبول کرد بازم از خواهم من امروی اولادم قبول کرد امروی من ازدواج کرد ازدواج کردید؟ بله بعد حاصل این ازدواج بچه دارید از اون مرد دو بله دو دختر و یک پسر دارم یعنی مجموعا پنج تا بچه دو بله. بله بعد چی شد که تصمیم گرفتی که فرار کنی از افغانستان؟ او آدم او آدم ما رو پیدا کرد پیدا کرد همسر اولید؟ بله دو, دو بار در پشت خانه ما آمد لطکوب که شور مشور شور دومیم کتک زدیش کتک زدیش نخواست که او بیای داخل که اگر او مرا دستگیر میکرد او مرا میکشد او نمیگذارد باز از همین بالاخره تصمیم گرفتیم که باید من فرار کنم از اونجا we hope you enjoyed uh, the video. I mean, there's so many things in this interview that really reveals the situation of women. I mean, the fact that she had to wear a burqa at from four years old. She wasn't allowed to go to school. She was married forcibly at a young age. She was beaten. Uh, you know, she was abused because she brought daughters and not sons. It's just on and on and on. It's like a never-ending tragedy. And, and she had to flee. Eventually she had to flee initially to another city, to her aunt, and then later on uh, abroad to be able to have a basic human life. And this is a situation of many women and people from Afghanistan, m many women from uh, Middle East and North Africa, and particularly Afghanistan, they have the only way that they can actually have a decent human life is to run away, and run away like thousands of um, refugees. And this is a heartbreaking, really, interview that we've, uh, we've seen. Um, and we need to recognize that people come in from um, Afghanistan. These are the stories that we need to listen and to hear and see the human beings and the situations under every single refugee who comes from Afghanistan or from Middle East. Yeah, especially when you hear very often, you know, people in the far right or racist and xenophobic groups uh, talking about fake refugees. Honestly, look and listen to the lives of people who are fleeing. And then it's it becomes so clear that honestly, the fact that they're still alive, they're still hoping moving, trying to reach a better way, a better, you know, society, a better life, just is, is it says volumes about hum humanity's resilience and the, the need for people to really be able to live human lives. So definitely refugees always welcome. We've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. Yes, and from me and Mariam Namazi, goodbye. Bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators 
It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.